presented by Ridley. Now and not yet. Welcome to the Now and the Not Yet, the show that keeps you plugged into everything happening in the Bible and theology. I'm Scott Harrell. And I'm Mike Bird. And in this episode, we talk about persons, personhood, artificial intelligence, androids, little chat programs that can write your sermons and maybe even do your pastoral care for you at church. We're also talking about digital church. Should we just all be online to do church? Now, I love me some technology, Scott. Yep. I think it can enhance our lives. Mm -hmm. It can make it better. But it can be a distraction. It can be something you get lost in. You know, I recently heard a, a, a really good quote where someone said, look, you know, like the internet is something we used to go into to escape from the real world. Sure. But now it's like we go into the real world because we want to escape from the internet. What do you mean? Well, because so much of our life is on the internet, isn't it? You know, we do uh, emails. We have all our work meetings yeah. on the internet. Gaming. Gaming. I mean, there's YouTube. You meet your wife on, on the internet. Oh, all sorts of things. I mean, everything now is done online. You pay all your bills online. You know, we've got all, we've got all these streaming services. There's blogs. There's podcasts. We seem to live most of our life online. And it's kind of like, well, I need a break from that to go into the real <laughs> world and have <laughs> yeah. some real human interactions, you know, not just avatars and comments. Do you know so, that people now yeah. go on dates to meet friends? There was really? an article on it this last weekend. It was like dating, but for friends. And so it's like people go online to meet friends to have in the real world is, as could, a break from online. As someone who's very introspective and doesn't have a lot of friends, can you tell me the website of this <laughs> yeah. thing? I could. Well, the problem, my problem is I don't, I don't have friends. My wife has friends and her friends have husbands. Yes. That's pretty much what my friendship circle That's ends right. up. That's you got the pressure to be friends with these husband figures. Yeah. Yeah, that's And that's don't get tricky. me wrong, some of them are very nice people, but some of them it's I have nothing in common yeah, with. Yeah, that's awkward. And it is a bit awkward. So the idea of like friend dating, this, this could work for me. Yeah. This, <laughs> this could work for me. Uh, but, you know, this creates the thing because you can now have your own personality on, you know, I could create my own personality on the internet. I could create an avatar where I am six foot six. And my name is Snoop Pope Daddy. Exactly. You know, and yeah. I am a rapping cath Catholic Gothic theologian. Sounds good. And that could be my persona. And I could live vicariously through that. And you might be a bit of a disappointment if we met you in real life. Exactly. Exactly. So you can see how people I could have my own I could have my own TikTok. And I could become famous, uh, it, but is that is that avatar really a person? That's one of the questions we're meeting right now. Exactly, as we have, we used to have artificial intelligence that was really an extension of yourself. So you'd have your memory bank on your phone, right? Yep. So that's extended intelligence. But now we're getting into artificial intelligence to the point where the AI can mimic most of the features that we would expect from a person and relate to us with most of the features that we would expect of a person as well. And with that has gone the acceptance of people marrying, mm -hmm. right, um, like basically dolls. Oh, wow. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. A doll? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with a name and a face and a personality and all that kind of stuff. And there's even laws actually in certain countries against bringing in certain kind of dolls into the country to relate to. Ah, yeah. okay. So it, it's quite a, quite a significant issue um, that's facing us. And in certain gaming groups and subcultures, there are, there are names for, for these uh, like dolls with personalities that you relate to and marry and all that kind of thing. And it's not, I'm not talking about a totally fringe thing, Mike. It's okay. becoming more and more popular. So the question of... I'm worried when it becomes normal. Well, the, so the question of personhood and what's unique to human personhood and what sets a human person and a, and a human to human relationship apart mm -hmm. from a, a human to artificial one is becoming blurred. It is. Especially, and here's the big thing, if relationships are transactional. Yep. So if I relate to people for the sake of my benefit, like pleasure, yep. it's actually easier to relate to a quasi-personal machine or yep. artificial intelligence than it is to a full-orbed image of God because images of God are complex. Real yeah. people are complicated. Yeah. 
So it's easier for me to get pleasure out of a quasi human than a real one. So there's this issue with men right now where they're basically staying home and choosing not to have human to human relationships, but they're choosing to have themselves relate to an artificial intelligence that's also embodied artificially. But that artificial intelligence with uh, machine embodiment is given a name, there's a relationship there, there's a history there, you can change hairs and facial features and, and all kinds of things. But it, it's becoming a significant phenomenon. So this sounds like Blade Runner is becoming true. Yeah. We've yeah. got these androids that are kind of human. <clears throat> do, you know, do you know what the original name of the novel was? Uh, do androids some, dream, dream of electric uh, sheep? Yes, yes. Which is, I thought, a weird name. Yeah. But it's, you know, but that's, that's what it became. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's asking the question of what separates androids from humans. Okay, if it's not a, it's not a soul, is that is that part of it? That, that's one of the, that's the features. one of the things? Okay. Yeah. Well, in that case, Scott, how would you define a person? Yeah, so um, I define a human person as... Um, a biopsychosocial entity yep. created by God for interpersonal relationships with himself and others as his images fit to rule and guide creation, redeemed in Christ and joined to him by the Spirit. Okay. Right? So that's your view of the person. Yeah, of the Christian person, yeah. What are some of the alternative, al alternatives view of personhood that we have out there? Because I know someone like you know Peter Singer. Uh, who, I've never liked Peter Singer. I mean, Peter Singer, Save the Whales, Euthanize Babies with Down Syndrome. Mm. That's a hard sell for me. That's a hard sell. So, yeah. Mm. But, but Singer would argue that a, a baby doesn't have the characteristics of personhood, but would say a chimpanzee does. Yes. So he would say a chimpanzee has more right to life than an infant up until it reaches a certain level of cognitive development. Yeah, because for him, independence is a marker of personhood. If you're a dependent human, if you're young or very old and unwell, yep. you're dependent on others so you're not fully a person. Yep. So that's what's understood as a gradualist view of a person. And that can't bode well for the vulnerable and that, that's a very ableist, uh, anti, you know. It's, it's, oh, of course uh, it is. So, I mean, that, that's not going to bode well for people with disabilities. No, no, no. So it's a functionalist approach to a person where function is confused with evolution as a person. Ah. Yeah. So um, other people go, well, let's not talk about persons as entities. Yep. What we need to talk about are relations. Yep. It is uh, such a being capable of relations and that's where it gets slippery. Yeah. Well, here's the thing on that because as an introvert, I'm not good as relationships as my extroverted wife is. Right. So does that mean she's more of a person than I am? Yeah. So if you have degrees. Yeah, well, you're she, agreeing. She's a, well, no, on that view. <laughs> I think no, that, you're both great people, okay. full persons. Yeah, but are we equally people or yes, is she you more are. a person? Yes, you are. Well, she's got a bubbly personality. You're kind of dour and dull, Michael, and a bit <laughs> Bible nerdy. You're not really a person in the full sense. Yeah, so okay. on a relational or gradualist view. Scared me, Scott. Uh, that would be incorrect. And now we have the new frontier, Mike. Yes. Which is with AIs. The Anglican Institute, love it. No, not the Anglican <laughs> okay. Institute. These these chat GPTs that can write assignments. Yeah, I've been messing with that man. I've been I've I've jumped onto that. Have you made a new friend? I haven't made any friends. Maybe a lot of enemies. Uh, yeah, I did have an argument with the chat GPT. You said something about yeah. So know, what's a chat GPT? Okay, basically it's an AI program where you can put into it a question, and it'll give you an answer. But it's based on not not just finding you a Google search and then saying you know go see these pages. It goes through all of its memory and data banks on the internet and other places, and it will synthesize an answer. Okay, so if you said like, you know, tell me about the history of the French Revolution, it will give you a, it will give you an answer. But then what it does, um, you could you could interrogate it. You can say, ah, could you focus on the work from this scholar, or could you tell me more about, you know, Robespierre? Uh, could you and 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 you can actually um, interrogate and, and help it improve the answer it gives you. So, Mike, a couple of weeks ago, you and I were live on our computers talking to each other mm. and I watched you ask this AI to develop an essay and refine it before my eyes. And I reckon in three minutes' time, you had 
asked it to craft an essay that I think would have got a 70% mark at a bachelor degree. Yep. It was, I, I honestly couldn't and believe it. And then we made it better. Yeah. We were able to tell it to do other things. To, add to, to tweak the introduction, To the tweak conclusion. the introduction, yeah, and we're able to make it better. It was amazing. And this is really weirding people out who work in tertiary education. So this is, this is you know, how you got plagiarism and yeah. people cut and paste stuff from Google into their essay or their exam. Um, we're way beyond that now. Yeah, you don't. Uh, yeah. And the only thing this stuff is missing is basically footnotes. Yeah. And it's real crazy. And... Maybe we need to go back to paper and pen exams or maybe we need to do oral exams because this is really changing uh, what's happening in the world. This is way beyond um, just Google searches. This is a whole new vista. And they even did some scary things where they got uh, the, the chat GPT to answer the questions on a medical exam and the AI was able to pass the oh, exam. Oh, wow. So, you know, is your doctor using chat GPT to pass his, to get his medical degree? <laughs> I hope not uh, because, you know, that's, that's the situation. So there's two schools of thought, Mike. Yes. One is uh, now that this technology is available, we don't want students using it to pass their assignments and exams. Yep, so, so we've, got to, we've got to circumvent it somehow. Yeah, yeah. We, we've got to ensure that the, that the learning is actually integrated into the person. Yep. And that the learning outcomes are that they actually know, understand, and can critically assess a body of language. Yep. That's one view. That's, that's the old school view, right? Yep. The other view is, no, this is a new frontier in technology. What we need to do is we need to help our students own, understand, describe, and assess the body of knowledge with the use of these AIs because that's where we're going. Yep. I so, mean, so it's that's, the that's adapt. Right. So basically, um, you know, rather than, you know, if there's a big tsunami coming towards you, which is, you know, AI in education, rather than get out a shotgun and shoot, shoot at the waves, uh, get out your surfboard yeah, build and dinghy. ride it and yeah. see where it takes you. Yeah. Uh, it could take you to a bad place. That's the problem. But this is what, this is what we're wrestling with, not, not just in theological education but all tertiary education. How is this going to change the way we teach and assess people, the learning outcomes, and because we want people to know about the Bible, theology, ministry, missions, uh, but this thing is now there and we can't mm. ignore it. We can't pretend it's not there. What are we going to do at this very moment? Um, educational experts around the world are trying to figure out and academic deans like me are sitting on the sidelines just waiting to see, you know, a bit of popcorn, my 3D glasses, <laughs> just trying to figure out how is this going to go down? Well, I'm thinking about it in terms of pastoral practice. Would you get it to write your sermons? Would you ask ChatGPT to write your sermons? No, because I wouldn't have gone through the process of researching, selecting, moulding the material around local illustrations for my local people. And what would you do if you were a senior minister and you found out your associate minister had been using it? Um, and I mean, I mean, I, this, this is the I problem think, we're going to face. Yeah, I mean, I think we'd have to talk about its, its value because here's the thing. One of my friends is a lawyer and he they basically use bots to do a lot of their research for them, mm -hmm. but they don't do the bots to write the reports for them. Yep. So they have a place for bots, but the bot isn't actually crafting the final product. So the, uh, my view is there's a place for it, but we need to be careful because it might come at the price of expertise as Christian Friends, brothers, sisters, ministers and so forth, it's particularly to do with pastoralia. If, you, if you're getting your AIs, if you're past, passing pastoral care and chaplaincy courses using AIs and you haven't really learnt how to be a certain kind of a godly person yep. through your course, then you're not going to be much use on the ground. So my main question is what difference does it make for pastoral care? Okay. That's how I'm approaching it. Well, that's, 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 a, good, that's a good thing to think about. But uh, as for those out there, um, tell us what in the comments section, what are you afraid about with ChatGPT and what do you think might be a good responsible use of it for Christian ministry? Mm. I'll, I'll finish off with one thought um, from John Paul II, Carol Volitia. He wrote this great book, um, love and responsibility, and his basic idea is that if we're going to have proper intimate relations, we have to understand each other as a whole person, a whole complex person, yep. and essentially a person to be served. 
if you're relating to bots and machines, basically you're going to relate to them in a way in which you're served. And you're going to get used to and conditioned to be served in relations. You're not going to learn how to serve others. So if I was to challenge one of the big personalists of the 20th century, Carol Volitia, he'd say no to the AIs and the robots in terms of significant relations because you'll learn the wrong way of relating to people and you'll be less likely to be Christ-like in your relationships. And I think that that's probably a good word to take on. Hi friends, hope you're enjoying the show. And if you are enjoying it, hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to share with your friends if you think they'll enjoy it too. And especially leave a comment or question. We'd love to hear from you. You know, Scott, the other day something happened. Mm. I woke up Sunday morning, uh, a tad later than I was planning, and I thought, you know, rather than drive all the way to church, why don't I just stay home and watch the live stream? In your PJs? Yeah, yeah in my PJs. Bowl of cereal, Great. and yeah, I could hear the sermon, yeah. I can hear the songs, and the whole thing. No inane chit chat after No, no inane chit chat. No, no lukewarm tea. No lukewarm cheap tea. Biscuits. No, yeah, stale bickies. Sounds great. And you look, you know, I, I can I can email a few friends during the week, check up, see how they're doing. You can even text them during the sermon, see how they're finding. Yeah, it. I, I could live tweet the sermon. It's like, yeah, yes. Pin McPherson is nailing yes. wisdom and proverbs. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo woo! I got yeah. a whole bunch of gifts and memes yeah. I could go with it. I mean, yeah, flex emojis. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You know, I could. I, that sounds like a ministry of encouragement. Yeah, to me. I, I, I I know. I could, like a good. I hope you stayed home. Yeah, I could. I could write a really good comment like "Love the service, great work, guys." Yeah, kiss, kiss, kiss. Yes, pray, you pray, could pray. increase their flow on then, YouTube. And I can share the link with my friends on Facebook. So evangelism, evangelism. This so, is great. So and and why not? Why not do do church like that? Why not? You know, I guess you, know, you need some warm bodies to sit in there. Congregation. Yeah, yeah. You well, maybe you just, you just need the just need the musicians and the minister in the one location. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, maybe a small crowd for those really weird psychotic people who need to be around other the people. Locals, yeah. The extroverts. Extroverts. Uh, yeah. People. I call it Barbara Streisand syndrome. Okay. People who need people are just sick and weird. Uh, and then the rest of us can just do the live stream and we can share on social media and maybe get together in a Zoom group after church if, no, if I need to someone else. No, no. Is is that? Is that church? Well, uh, I don't think it's how the early Christians understood the church. Well, that's, that wasn't my question. Is, is, is church a digital, can it be a digital community? Because this is now the big frontier, and, and, and this was already happening because a lot of churches were live streaming what they do, and they've got their, you know, all the sermons are available on podcast. A lot of pastoring can be done via phone or email, just checking in with people how yep. they're doing, mm. um, make sure they're coming to, you know, whatever events that are on, you know, ask people, if, you know, do they want to be on the roster and all that. And, and this is the thing. Uh, so is it, the, the, yeah. the digital world, and it's been ex, accelerated by COVID, yeah. because at COVID we had no choice in Melbourne but to That's do right. church in the digital sphere. Yeah. So where does that fit in? Is this is is the digital world now going to replace the church? Is it going to become a parallel church? Where where do we go with this? What is happening? Okay, can I describe what I call the complementary model? Okay. So I was preaching at my friend's church in North Box Hill last week. It's a church that has strong links to Malaysia and Singapore. Yep. At the beginning of the service, there was a welcome, and as part of the welcome, they uh, asked everybody who was Zooming in to turn on their screens, and whoop, they all appeared. Very wow. dramatic. Wow. They were all waving, and you could see in the background, it was like they were in these high-rise buildings in, in Malaysia, like yeah. not in Melbourne at all. What was amazing was they had a dedicated pastor to look out for everybody who was Zooming in. Yep. And during the service, that pastor was going to be interacting with that group and was dedicated to that group. Right. So we had the music, the singing, everything was fantastic. You could see everybody participating, right? Yep. I got up to do the sermon, preaching away, and the people are still on Zoom engaged. It's amazing. So, so that they're actually engaged. After the sermon, we had a call to faith. It was great, by the way. People yep. came forward and all that kind of stuff. 
And what was going on was while we were in the church in Box Hill, yeah. engaged with the people that were coming forward and praying and, and doing pastoral counseling and that kind of thing, the online pastor was pastoring with that group online. Yeah. Okay. So we're a long way away from PJs and cereal sitting at, at home disengaged on the couch. Yep. These people were very, very involved in what was going on in the service. And the coolest thing was that the church was prepared, willing and able to minister to them yep. using the resources that were available. So I thought it was a very inclusive model where it's complementary. But here's the kicker, yeah. and I wasn't expecting this, mm -hmm. The pastor said, and he was being cheeky and it's because he's an Aussie and I loved it, he's like, well, the good thing about this, all these people coming in and the possibility of Zooming in always, is that you can finally have 100% church attendance even if you've got the flu or yeah. COVID or you're in hospital. So what's cool about that is like this isn't for the lazy. This is to ensure that we can always be together on Sundays. Yep. So it's not the lazy person's approach. I, I really like it. This isn't Duna Church. Yeah, the, it's actually church. So it's not e-church, so it's not replacing church, but it's meant to be a supplement. But can I push back, Scott, and say, well, those friends in Singapore and Malaysia, why aren't they attending a local church there? And being part of the physical community, the communion of the saints, because it's hard to break. You can do a lot of things online. You can't break bread online. That's true. You can't have sit down at a coffee and, and explain to someone the highs and lows of your week. Yes, that, that's a downside. Yes. And so, yeah. and the sad, but the sad fact is, you you say, well, it's not just you know um, bowls of cereal and pajamas, but you know some of those people zooming in. I understand they're all far away and they're you know like family members or they're sick. But what about someone who's like, meh, I don't want to. I don't want to drive across town today. And they just want to do the pajamas and a bowl of, of um, special K. Yeah. There's nothing there to stop that. Mm. So you so there there is a pessimistic side, and my concern is is that one of the greatest heresies or one of the greatest spiritual apathies at the moment is how much we love convenience. Yeah. Convenience, I think, is becoming an awful thing, and we are craving convenience over authenticity. We are cra uh, craving uh, convenience as now the number one metric for all the things that we do. And and there comes the, pr the problem is we want things that are convenient and cost us nothing. Mm. And that's the one bit that scares me. I do think, my, my own theory, and I, and I, th I, I think um, digital church or the digital space now has to be understood as to a serious part of ministry. Yeah. Because when I was in the army, we used to talk about you've got, you know, you've got sea space for you do war, air space for the air force and land, and then they brought in what was called that was called C three. Then they brought in what was called C four I, which was so which was then divided into information and and cyber. Mm. As the air, so we know we don't just fight on the seas and on the land and in the air. We now fight an information war, yeah. you know, and that can be like you know, um, people giving false information through yeah. the media, propaganda, uh, you know, um, you know, you know, having your own websites hacked. Yeah. And I think it's similar for ministry, we have to accept it's no longer just the front door, the pulpit, and the pews. Now we have to think about ministry and mission in this digital space, not as a replacement. Uh, but it, it's just another space in which our ministry happens. Yes, and and that's the thing um, I, I want people to know. So I I, I don't want. I'm I'm a little bit concerned about the heresy or the apathy of convenience. Yes, but I also think is we've got to remember that the digital space is now a space where we have to be active in mission and ministry. Yeah, how would you feel about a model in which? You understand people zooming in and participating in services as being complementary to what they do in their local context. Uh, yeah, as long as it's complementary rather than a substitute for. Right, okay. No but it's worries. very hard to police that and to, to pass to that when the temptation is for us when we love convenience is to, no, oh, okay, I'll come in three times a month yep. and then twice a month, sure. then, then once a month. Sure. And, yeah, next thing you know, you haven't been to church because you're too busy doing everything on your iPhone. Yeah, I understand that. So you're happy that for short periods of time, if we're unwell or overseas, 
being part of the technologically enabled involvement in a church service is fine. Yep. But it's not a medium term. Yeah, it's solution. a tool. We need to use it. We have to use it. But I'm concerned it's going to become a very easy thing to replace what should be the communion of saints. Yeah. And by that you mean physical sharing in sacraments, teaching and confession together. Exactly. But for the people out there, tell us, uh, what does your church do in the digital space? Do you live stream your services? Do you have a digital pastor, an e-pastor? Let us know. We we would generally love yeah. to hear. Yeah, I'm really interested in best practice because I think that we're trying hard to do a good job and do it properly. Yeah, that's that's what we want. Mike, I love the fact that your mug says, you're my sunshine. Well, Scott, that sums up my relationship with you. You're a little bit of su sunshine in the darkness that is the theological quagmire of the mortification of sin wow. in the domain of the poop in the motel of the evil of the Valentinian churches of life. Okay, sounds like a bit of Irenaeus may be helpful to you. Yeah, or Irenaeus as the case may be. <laughs> There we go. Right. Okay, cool. we, got, we got some book reviews. You got. You give us yours first. Scott. Okay, give us yours. So Juan Manuel Burgos, Spaniard, he writes on personalism, and his basic thesis is that as we think about the kind of world and society that we need to have, we need to begin with the person in relations. Mm -hmm. And what he does is he gives you an overview of the Christians who have been working in what's known as personalism from the late 1800s to today and how in their different ways they have resisted oppressive movements to persons and relations in its many forms and how they've promoted life and flourishing in terms of persons, relations and communities. They've also tied it into political movements. So his thesis is if you have a rich and robust understanding of persons, relations and communities, you should be able to at a local level protect one another from impersonal forces that would oppress you and drive persons away from one another, which is the worst thing you could do to a human person, is to artificially isolate them and disallow them from being a gift to one another. So this is an introduction to personalism. If you are a Bible study group leader or someone beginning your journey into theology, this is brilliant for the study of anthropology or the study of what we believe about humanity. I highly recommend this book. It's worth a read. For people who are maybe working at a master's level or you want to pursue some research in terms of persons and particularly to do with artificial intelligence or extended personhood, um, I suggest this book by Ebner. Uh, this is a great book. Sorry, Ebel. This is a great book because he talks about the fundamental biopsychosocial and spiritual features of human beings that are behind our uniqueness. So this is a very theological book where this one is historical, philosophical. So they go together. And if you're a master's student studying here at Ridley College, this is the kind of book you'd want to have under your belt for studying ethics and apologetics with myself. So they're both highly recommended. Yeah, I want to recommend and talk about a couple of books that deal with the whole debate about being a digital church. So the first one is by Dave Adamson. Uh, he's an Aussie guy. He's worked a lot in America, and he's written a book called Meta Church. And, you know, the, the digital revolution is a revolution, and all revolutions are disruptive. And Dave tells us to embrace that revolution, embrace it or be crushed by it. And he says things like, you know, for a lot of people, um, your church's YouTube page is going to be the front door that they come into your church through. Now, you can accept that or deny it, but for the most of the people who find your church, it's not going to be because they drove past it. Sometimes it's going to be because they saw it on YouTube mm -hmm. or they saw TikTok or Twitter or whatever it was. And you've got to embrace that. Uh, so he, he's, he's writing about that very much pro-embracing the digitalization of ministry. Uh, the other book that's on this topic is by James White, and it's called Hybrid Church. And this is, I think, it's more what you're saying, that you know, we've got to integrate the online space into our own ministry and make the most of it. Mm. And he, he makes some very interesting um, 
observations like how church has changed since 2007. You know, the invention of the iPhone uh, was a massive thing. In the history of human civilization, yeah. the fact that we have all this computing technology and media in our hands, that changes the, the way we think, the way we organize and access information. And it's got to accept, uh, it's got to impact, I should say, uh, the way we, uh, we, we disseminate stuff, the yeah. way we, we organize, the way we connect, and that's got to affect our own churches as well. So I'm not necessarily endorsing everything said in those books, just to be clear, but the two best books about thinking about the church in the digital, digital age are Meta Church and Hybrid Church. Check mm -hmm. them out if you want to know about digital ministry. Sounds like both books will push us to at least respond to them and to think about why is it that we either buy the argument that YouTube is the front door of our church or why we don't. Exactly, and that's what we've got to wrestle with. You can't pretend it's not there, yeah, yeah. but the fact is uh, how is your church going to do ministry given that there is this digital space, this digital angle mm. that's now there? There's a huge role for those kind of books that, that kind of wake us up out of our slumber remind us of what we're dealing with, and then try to be constructive about it. Yeah, Sounds and, great. And what we need are people to think theologically, not just pragmatically. Yeah, right. And I think this is a great tool. I'm going to use it. Uh, people who are going to think theologically and have an ecclesiology, a doctrine of the church, Yeah. and then they're going to look at this stuff exactly. rather than allow the the the, uh, the mechanism to determine the theology. Yeah, that's right. What, that's what I think is, is important. There's got to be a lot of stuff done here. But that's for people to check out and read. And yeah, and Scott, that's it. But thank you everyone for joining us for this uh, recent season of Now and Not Yet. It has been terrific. Uh, if you can, do us a favor, like, subscribe, leave a comment, question and share with anyone you think will benefit from the content we've had this season. Thank you for joining us. It's been excellent. And hopefully we'll see you again at the next season of the Now and Not Yet. <laughs>